then you you put that picture of your father and we think that God is that picture and like working so hard to not let that picture of my own father be superimposed onto God yeah and then all the while you're like subconscious will just do that How did we get here? Yeah, my best friend's filming me crying in a rental car in the middle of nowhere, Montana. Kind of a long story. Like my entire life long story. My name is Caleb. This is four days into a week long trip we took from Minneapolis to Montana. The idea was for us to sit down with these random strangers along the way and see if we can find some stories. Some good stories. The dude behind the camera is Aaron. We've been best friends since we were 10. Wait, wait, we Caleb, can... Caleb, Caleb, I'm Aaron. I am Aaron. I can introduce myself. I was born in no, February no, no, of 20. No, we're not there yet. We're, we're not. Okay, uh, then I'll introduce you. No, this is I am able to introduce myself. And I am able to introduce okay, you. Okay, Aaron, the film hasn't even started yet, and we're already fighting. You okay? No, don't. <laughs> you have your own mic. Gonna be okay? Yes. Okay. Sorry I didn't let you introduce yourself. You want to introduce our friendship? I would like that. Caleb and I met when we were like 10 at a performance art school. Both of us raised in a nine-person home. Both of us raised by artists. We quickly fell in love with performing. Started with dancing. Then moved to theater. We did the music thing too. And we ended up in film. It started with us making stupid videos of ourselves. And we got pretty good at it. Ended up making some cool videos for other people. Through it all, there's one through line. We love telling stories. Good stories. And that brings us to why Caleb is crying in this rental van in Montana. Well, almost. Let's rewind like seven days. It's kind of a mess right now. We have to leave on Monday. I haven't packed much. We're still hearing back from people. It's been a long day. It's just a mess right now. Long, horrible day. Yeah, we have a lot to do tomorrow. So, we got an idea. Let's drive to Glacier National Park and sit down with strangers and ask them to tell us their stories. But where do we find them? So I made contact with Sika yesterday. I'm going to call him. How do we get random strangers to be vulnerable? What questions do we ask them? Like relationship with parents is like so key in who they are. How do you think your relationship with your father influenced your idea of God? Creates this whole understanding of the father. Parents got divorced. Okay. 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 How much pain is still there? We are about to leave. Go on this crazy road trip. This is insane. Every time you saw. We don't need cannibal grocery. We can get other things. <laughs> Last stop. Only stop going to Glendon. We really had no idea what we were getting into. We knew one thing. We just wanted to find a pilot who would fly us over the Glacier National Park mountain range in Montana. He said, yeah, I'll take you up on Saturday. Fly you around. That's not what he said. He just said that he's willing to meet with us. How we would find him, couldn't tell you how this amazing story unfolded, I honestly couldn't tell you. Caleb is counting down from five to four, three minutes to two minutes. <laughs> like, yeah, I'm nervous. It's our first one. We could not have written this better ourselves. Who is this guy, Caleb? They call him Chainsaw Scott. <laughs> would inevitably trigger some deep, deep memories. Um, uh, so, Scotty. Mm -hmm. He uh, talked a lot about how his dad was his hero. 
um, talked about his childhood. So, like, take me through your earliest childhood memory. So, how do we meet Sky? We mapped a route from Minneapolis to Glacier National Park and found a bunch of small towns along the way. Glendid, Minnesota. It seemed small, so we plucked it out of Google Maps. First planning session. We mapped some businesses around the area and found Andy Lake Woodworks. We called up Scotty uh, and asked if two strangers from Minneapolis could sit down for an interview and hear his life story. Thankfully, yeah, yeah. he agreed. <laughs> Here's a funny one, I guess. Um, so when I was, I think I was six, I shot my first bird with my BB gun. And it was a little little yellow finch. <laughs> I had a, took a shoe box and I went and picked a bunch of flowers. It looked like I was giving my sister a pair of shoes. So she's, she's opening it in front of her friends. And here I am, proud as can be, thinking I'm giving this cool gift. And it's this dead yellow finch <laughs> with the wings out <laughs> with a bunch of flowers in it. And um, I enjoyed it or? She didn't enjoy it. Yeah. But, uh, like one of our favorite things to do was like build Legos. We would take the, the Duplos that we had and we'd make these huge towers and we'd tower it all the way to the ceiling. I don't know, it was like building something that's bigger than you, you know? Like, and then having your dad there to help you is like... Hunting with my dad in the outdoors, that's how I grew up. You know, taught me everything with the outdoors and how to be respectful to animals and nature and always give back. I can remember like the stark contrast between when we would play with Legos ourselves and when my dad was there. Astronomically different. You'd have spent two days talking to him if he was sitting here. He's that kind of guy. I don't know about my other siblings, but me, definitely. Um, so I look up to him in so many different ways. It's hard for me to like put words to that. I couldn't ask for anything better. It's like the most amazing thing of like creating with your father. <laughs> it um, sounds crazy to say that. Let's go. So, what did you think about that conversation? I think it's beautiful. I love that. I know it can be cliche, you know, your parents' yeah. heroes, but uh, definitely, definitely my dad was my childhood hero. I always wanted to be like my dad, and I always wanted to talk to my dad, and I always wanted, like, he was my world. Um, kind of guide me through guide me through life from when I was five all the way through college and stuff, so. So, at, like, astronomically blessed that I had a father who pursued me that way when I was younger. So now we're on our way to Newtown. Let's go there. We are trying to find a campsite so that we can go What drew you to dance and theater growing up? Like, why did you want to do that? I think it's obvious. I mean, it's just because my parents were doing it. Yeah. Not just because, but I mean, you look at your parents and they're like dancing together. I look at my dad and I'm like, okay, I want to do that. But then I also look at my parents as like a couple and I saw like a really wonderful marriage That was like a really awesome picture of marriage was both of my parents dancing together. And and I think also my parents were around with all of that stuff. They were teachers at the performance arts school that I like took classes at. So like there's this comfort of your parents being in this environment where you're learning to do the thing that your parents are doing. It's like I look back on it and I'm like it's the simplest little thing, but like it makes so much sense why it was so impactful. Why was it impactful? He was present. He was present, yeah. Like, he was there. And, and, when, and when he was there, not only was he there physically, he was there emotionally. And he was there, like,
Yes. So <laughs> we found a field. <laughs> we we found a field. We don't know <laughs> where we are exactly, but <laughs> it's freezing outside. There's like a swarm of bugs in there. Goodness, frick. Okay. Oh, I'm getting eaten alive. Oh my gosh. That is what we, we camped, camped at. in the swamp. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. Are you guys moving? That's right. Guys, I want to be in that. There you go. You can wave at it. We're traveling cool, from uh, Minneapolis to the Park. That's cool, dude. Uh, where are you guys from? Here. Here? Yeah. Yeah? What do you do? Well, I rope. You rope? Yeah, I'm still going to high school. What is rope? Like team roping? <laughs> yeah, he's a cowboy. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. this guy, uh, he goes. Yeah, yeah we ride horses. If you want to, yeah, I was actually going to go out there right now. It's uh, Bell Creek, you know, back there, the line of the host book, you know. It, yeah, yeah. Do you like waivers? Uh, so oh, that yeah. way, if you guys get hurt, um, you guys pretty much can't, can't take this guy to court. You know? Yep, yep. Yeah, so, you know, we ran into Sky Lee at the gas station and happened to ask you about what we were doing. I mean, at the same time, you know, we're unpacking a ton of gear from our car. <laughs> it's like, what are you doing? <laughs> you know, and then you, you talked to him and we just got to meeting and um, we found out that they, they rope horses and they ride horses for a living. And, you know, he called his boss right there. Uh, talking to him right now in the general store, um, they want to know if uh, they might be able to uh, get some filmage of, of us riding horses. And then, um, they they, they want to uh, kind of trap, you know, uh, right? Dude, it still makes me laugh awesome. of just how awesome. crazy awesome. that meeting was. <laughs> yeah. uh, my name is Natasha Hall Chase. I am a member of... And then uh, Natasha, actually, I contacted her a while back before we even left and is kind of like a counselor for Native American women who have been abused. It's honestly, it's heartbreaking, the amount of abuse Within my childhood is where a lot of my, tra my trauma sits. You know, like my mom, she was very angry whenever she was um, hungover, pretty much. So, I mean, we all knew to stay away from her whenever, you know, and I spent a lot of time alone. That's why whenever I have problems or issues, I, I like to, you know, be alone in the silence. Come arrest me. I may not be able to relate with their early adolescent years, but I can relate with the fact that we all were introduced to a god when we were younger. My, one of my early mentors is my grandmother. You know, she was like my mother while, while my mom was out doing her thing. Uh, my grandfather, right here, uh, Reverend uh, Edward Goodbird, he was the first um, minister uh, for the uh, religious part of their, whenever the reservations were established. So my, my grandmother was really religious. She taught me all about Jesus. And honestly, that's why I can say that saved my life. My favorite memory would be with my grandma. She did counsel me a lot. She did take me in under her wing and she did teach me about our Rikurasanish ways. Being able to sit with relatives and pray, and that's where I found deep, deep healing. I found where I come from. That feel is a fly, that soul is undone. My dad and I would have these spiritual conversations all the time. I'm so thankful that my dad introduced God to me. And I would just, I, honestly, I would just ask him questions, you know, about God and about the universe and about, you know, the world, you know, these things that are, he's passionate about. And I was always like, Dad, the way you think about stuff is so cool. Like, he was just awesome when I was a kid, you know, like, your dad's your hero. Anything that he thinks about, anything that he expresses, is like the coolest thing you've ever heard. <laughs> Well, my dad was probably my god for a long time in my early childhood. And then like when your dad like introduces God, like because your dad has been your god for so long, he just automatically takes all the traits that your father has. 
Like, that's just a natural way it goes. What are characteristics that you remember that kind of stick out to you about God when you were a kid? Presence, dude. It's funny that that is the same thing. That's interesting, that connection of like, as a child, you didn't really remember much, just the fact that your dad was emotionally present. Mm -hmm. And you felt like God was a God who was emotionally present. Yeah. Wow. I'm honestly just realizing that right now, as we speak. It's a lot. Yeah. How will we tie it? How do you think we could tie it in? To, like, what do you think are the big moments? That part where she talks about her pain, and we should have a little conversation about that. About uh, pain? Pain. Oh, Hardship. oh, with, with how it how involves it, us. How it involves us, and like how, like the things that we have done, or the things that we have gone through. Kind of like bring me through where there was a shift, and like when things kind of started to your dad suddenly became not so much of a hero. And so we left the beautiful reservation in Newtown, North Dakota and headed for Medora, North Dakota. Met Norma. Now precisely what do you want me just to start? Where I can, what, earliest memory? Yeah, so first I'll have you. So Norma. Myers. How do we meet Norma Myers? Well, we figured out, you know, Medora's the place to go next. Uh, so we found a youth summer camp and contacted the guy who ran it. So he introduced us to Norma Myers, the local nut shop owner. We met her the day of, pulled up to her shop. She didn't even know we were coming. We opened the door and we said, Norma, can we interview you? And she said, sure. And so we cleared out her nut shop, put a bunch of lights, and she closed it for two hours and told us her life story. I was born in December of 1925, and my brother was born in June, June 11th, on my grandmother's birthday in 1927. Norma would be all bright and talkative and cheery, but uh, whenever mom was brought up, you could tell she would get emotional and pretty teary-eyed. What was your relationship like with your parents growing up? My relationship? With your parents. How was that growing up? Oh, my father um, and I had a very good relationship. My mother and I never did until I was probably 70. She said at the beginning that she's never had a good relationship with her mom until she was like 70. Can you imagine that? And my mother was often frustrated and um, I never knew why she punished me. On our back door, it's where my father hung his razor strap. You know, they used to strap where they used to sharpen their single-bladed razor. And she liked to grab that and strap me. And that's where I learned not to cry. I would not cry no matter what she did to me. Currently in my family, there's a lot of like hardship and um, like a shattering of reality because my dad was um, unfaithful and has like pulled way back in terms of just being there for us. And I remember the during the time of like that being the reality. I remember there was a time where I'm like, I don't understand why, I don't understand. She, I, I guess the best way to explain, she didn't 
present God as a loving God. Um, it was difficult. It's very, it's a difficult for me. And it just sucks because like, like you look at the way that God pursues us And I always like wanted my father to pursue me that way. I guess the best way to explain it, she didn't present God as a loving God. So far we've just been staying at free campsites and there are no free campsites around here. Caleb is talking to some of our people here to see if they know of any place we can stay at. If not, we could set up a tent right here. And just fly <laughs> yeah, didn't think this one through. I asked her about some free campsites, and she was like talking to me about some options. But then her husband like stopped her in the background, was like, "No, just have them stay in someone's house. Just let's just call some people." Okay, so you're good. Um, stay with Benji and Joe and yeah, so I told him I would go ahead and send your number to him as well so he can know, you know, that you're calling. He yeah. did want me to let y'all know that they have a dog and a couple of cats. Are y'all allergic to it? Well, we already ate. Stop. You already ate. Thanks, <laughs> <Save> man. <laughs> Okay, let me. So what about you? Thank you so much. You're welcome. Yeah. So, um, yeah. I'm the oldest of seven. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. My parents met in Chicago at a dance studio. Um, but, uh, yeah, recently my my parents are in the middle of going through a divorce. I'm so, sorry. Yeah, it's, sorry. It's, rough. It's, it's real rough. Yeah. It's painful. But, um, yeah, my mom lives at in an apartment with the younger five. And then, I don't know, it's hard to track down my dad these days. Um, <laughs> so. I'm not gonna do so. anything <laughs> yeah. to, that, to the bedding downstairs until I've found out that you guys are out of the state. Okay, okay, right. okay. okay. thank you okay. so God much. Bless you. God bless. I shouldn't have had the coffee, it makes me really much. <laughs> Where's my hot tea? Um, and I was going to ask you about the grief process with the mm. divorce, mm. because it's interesting because, you know, you go through a period and then it hits you again. Yeah. So be ready yeah. for that. Yeah. You know? Oh my gosh. I like, she was talking about how when you're in the grieving process, it'll like hit you and then it will like take a lull and then it'll hit you again. And I think it's after a time of like being able to be out of the, out of like the thickness and you are in like a, a nice level, like field of, of, of emotional health where you're not like, emotionally unstable all the time because it gives you time to like reflect because when you're in the thick of it it's like it's so hard to even like think straight because your emotions are just flying everywhere and then after you have a time where you like feel like you've settled it'll just hit you again like she was saying 
because it like gives you time to just like look at it again and you can just see how much pain is still there. Especially for someone who's like as important to you as your father. Alright, Rachel. Here we come. Here we come. There wasn't one specific moment, but it was like this weird shift. I think it was like right as I was entering into high school. I grew, there was a distance that just grew between me and my father. Like again, like it was really confusing for me because he was around, but he wasn't emotionally there like he was when I was a kid. There was a time in life where I would go to my dad for like everything. And then just after, you know, I would say it was probably equally just as much him pulling back within the relationship, but also like I pulled back, you know, just probably just as much. And it's interesting because I still looked at him as this kind of perfect figure. I blamed it on myself, honestly, because my dad was perfect. So I was like, something's wrong with me, why I can't relate with my dad. And because of that, things start slipping into that relationship that don't belong there. Bitterness. Bitterness and, and resentment. And I, I don't know, we just had those conversations less and less. You know, those spiritual conversations that I was talking about, like, those just started going away. I don't know. It almost seemed like my dad was disappearing. and like working so hard to not let that picture of my own father be superimposed onto God. Yeah. And then all the while, you're like subconscious would just do that. There's a lot in there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm excited. Okay, cool. Yeah. So um, let's start with your childhood and we can like move forward into now. Let's just, like, can we talk about your parents' divorce and how that kind of shaped like your you as a kid and like what yeah. kind of the tendencies yeah. that, can you just explain a little bit? So it was our stop in Missoula where we met Rachel. Olivia on the phone here, she told us about her friend who lived in Missoula, so we contacted her. Morning, how are you? We kept in touch with her throughout. Caleb awkwardly asked her if there were any other people who were more interesting than her that we might be able to interview. If you think that there are other interesting people, we can also just interview, interview some of those people out there instead of you guys. Um, but, yeah. That was, that was awkward. But Rachel was, she was quite the story. But not before showing up at the wrong house. Hi. We are right on your doorstep. I think so. Oh. 3-8-24. 3, 4, oh, oh, well, <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's good to meet you. She grew up in San Diego, she was born while her mother was still a senior in high school, her grandfather tried pressuring her mother into aborting Rachel, um, Rachel's mother refused, so she was kicked out of the house, um, she grew up at her father's house, um, where drugs were prevalent. She later moved to Montana for school and is settled here in this beautiful state. Yeah. So um, my father um, got addicted to meth when I was very young, I think four or five years old. And I remember my mom pulling my brother and me out of the house and we lived with my aunt for a period of time when I was nine. 
and um, I think part of that was to just kind of like give my dad a, a kind of a taste of what it would be like if we were gone but I think he, at that time he was so steeped in his addiction that he wasn't able to think straight I don't know I guess where'd you grow up how'd you grow up what was life like as 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 Sika as yeah. a boy as you can tell you know my with my accent and I'm, I'm not from here I'm from the island of Samoa is uh, I grew up in a small village you know very less fortunate family we had to work for everything and uh, some things were hard for us to dad was kind of come and go and I can remember those are one of the lowest part time of my life is is when dad wasn't home and and that was low. Sika was another crazy connection. When we were looking at towns on the way to Glacier National Park, we found the Flathead Reservation in a town there called Ronan that we decided we'd stop in. We reached out to a church there, uh, asked if they knew of any Native Americans who had any stories to tell. They connected us to Sika. So I made contact with Sika yesterday. Sika said he'd try to find a few guys. When we showed up, Sika said he couldn't find a few guys, so we just had to interview him and his friend Larry, neither of which were Native American, but both of which had incredible stories to you tell. You said that you would rather him give you the silent treatment than slap you around. Was your dad abusive? He wasn't abusive, but he threatened a lot. Okay. Once in a while I get it, but he threatened a lot. He had big hands, mm. so I envisioned him just smacking me and knocking my face to the other side. So I said, I'll just take, yeah, don't talk to me, that's, that's good for me. Yeah. But it wasn't, see, because then that communication represents relationships. So that means that was cut. And that affected my view of God. My, my dad went to Hawaii and he wrote to us. And I read that dad is going to uh, buy us our tickets. We're going to fly to Hawaii. We're going to move to Hawaii, right? I was so excited, you know, like, wow, this is going to be really, you know, I was dreaming of Hawaii. And then two months later, mom told me well, we're, we're leaving. I said, what happened, mom? Well, I guess dad is, is not coming back. And I cried and cried, you know, and it's just like, why? And if I remember well, he was with another woman. My mom, you know, is not going to be in his life anymore. And all of a sudden you feel like, well, I must protect my mom. And those were tough time, you know, being a little kid, trying to protect your own mom. You know, when somebody's so close to you that you treasure, it makes you wanna dress her, her heart, you know, and what she desires. So, You would say that was probably the most painful point yes, of your yes, life? of my life, yeah. Yeah, I would. Yeah, it's I would. knowing that your mom is going to be alone yeah. and your dad will never come back. So I vividly remember he and I being on the phone and I'm sitting on the staircase when he was telling me, hey, I have a drug problem and I'm going to go to jail. It, it was horrible. You know, like you see these cars here, these cars here, you know, it was all from from dads, you know, abusive physically. I had hatred towards my dad. Wake up and I listen. Is that kind of room? Voices men gone before me. One of the worst things that ever happened to me is I went to this school called Creighton, Creighton High School. And they had to take a test to get in. And I passed the test, but then they expelled me. Really bad thing that I did. My dad was so upset. He didn't talk to me for, I don't know, a month, six weeks. Cut me out of his life. He'd come home, I'd say, hi, Dad. He'd never say nothing. Yeah, that was, that was really bad. <laughs> At first, I said, that's good. He won't, he won't slap me around or anything. That's good. I'll just take the silent treatment. But it wasn't good. To the point, I got to the point. It took him a long time. I got to the point. So, what the heck with you? I don't care if you ever talk to me. So, you know, I got angry and bitter and stuff like that. So, I was in Hamilton for a while, and then the summer before my senior year, I went back to San Diego, moved in with my dad, and he's an iron worker, and he was working. He was then going to be working in San Francisco, so he said, "I'll be home on the weekends." 
um, he was also, he was on drugs and his addiction just kind of took him away from a while, for a while. So it was just brutal, right? Um, so then I ended up just kind of escaping. I didn't know what to do. I was scared. I was living in this huge city by myself. And then... When I was young, my dad would take me on these like father-son dates and um, like I loved them so much. I like would ask them before they were even over when the next one would be. Um, and as like time went along, they became less and less. My relationship with my father really became, started getting gray. Like we were out of touch with each other. And because like, as you get older, like things change as you get older. And it's not that, you know, it, 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 it would have been fine if, you know, we stayed connected as the dates were not what made the relationship good. It was just the manifestation of a good relationship. It was a manifestation of a father pursuing his son. And I think we all long for our fathers to pursue us in that way. And it like, when your father doesn't pursue you well, it kind of creates this hole in you. Because, because he wasn't, my dad wasn't there, so the understanding of a father was, was, I don't like this. You guys are making me cry. <laughs> Sorry, bro. You know. I don't know. I would think this is common in children because we have this thing with our parents where we we strongly desire their approval, and that wasn't available from him, and so there was this void, and and it and it wasn't being filled. And so, I, I don't know, I don't know, like I can say that now, but at the time I didn't know, I just knew that I was hurt. My dad was not, like, this shouldn't be an issue. Like, you're a dad. And it's just a hole that like, really, it's just heart aching, honestly. And it's just so painful. But uh, I began to ask questions later on in life yeah. about a lot of stuff. And I began to realize the way I grew up in my family wasn't the way it's supposed to be. Unfortunately, our fathers are human <laughs> as much as us. As time goes by, you know, it's just this kind of this cycle of humans not being able to meet this need that kind of grows inside of us. I took him to this nice restaurant, and I could, I, I could remember the look on his face, like, what is this? Almost like himself, like he didn't deserve this. And I could see the guilt in his face. And I said, Dad, just enjoy it, just you and me, don't worry, you know. And he started breaking down, crying, you know. And, and almost like he was like, and I could tell him, I finally got, got out of him that his childhood was worse than mine. Here I am thinking, and, and, and for him to just crying, I just, I just hugged Dad and say, Dad, I'm so sorry, you know, that you, you had to go through that, you know. It's more like, here I am thinking my life, my life upbringing was bad, till I hear his story, I'm like, he's another human being, you know, he made mistakes.
crazy thing is like as we went along, the people we talked to recognized the same thing and it's not our fathers that can fill that hole. It's somebody who's perfect, who can love perfectly because our fathers don't love us perfectly. I'll tell you another story. I got a lot of stories. Yeah. I was in Japan, my little girl, Julia, she, I just taught her how to ride a two-wheeler bike. And I said, don't ride anybody on it because you don't know how to ride and you're going to fall off and you'll hurt your friend. Well, she didn't listen. Her little friend, Mina, got on the back of the bike and sure enough, Aunt Julia fell. It was a blacktop. It was bleeding a bit. So we rush out there because everybody's screaming. I picked up the girl, Mina, and I put her on my lap. And then we're going to pray for her. We called her mom and the mom said, oh, that's okay. And I'm going to pray for her. And everybody's kind of, a few people are gathered around, but I see Julia off in the corner. And I'm looking at her, she's there crying, but she's not in the group. And God says, bring her to you and put her under your other knee. And God said, this is a picture of my father's lap. <laughs> Amen. Why you have sandbags, kids? This is cool. <gasps> Who's arrested? Shoot, dude. Aaron's glasses broke. The wind picked up and and it knocked over the C-stand. And I had hung my glasses on the C-stand. And now they are broken in half. Are they prescription? Yeah. Ouch. They said that we, oh, they said go to Ronan. I mean, I could drive back, does this look better? <laughs> <laughs> they said maybe some like super glue or something. We can try a couple things. We're gonna have to try a couple things. Larry, he wasn't a super emotional guy. He did like talk about painful things in a pretty straight tone. But the moment that he talked about God's goodness and the fatherness of God, he would break down immediately and start crying. You can't fake that. You don't fake that. It's like this is someone who has genuinely experienced I That's cool, man. I love the way this song too. A fatherness. That next morning, we woke up and we packed up and we left. Larry was our last planned interview. We were like, Saturday, let's try to get an airplane. But everything fell through, everything. It is Saturday morning and we had one connection for a plane and it fell through, so. The thing about this is it's not just like a. It's not the fascination of like uh, never doing it before or something. Yeah, it's, it's like. It's just like we're in Montana, there's mountains everywhere. Let's get in the sky. Let's get in the sky and film the mountains from the sky. Yeah. So we headed up to Glacier National Park. Um, not knowing what we're gonna do. No, we didn't know. When we talk about these things, you can look at them yes. and all you see is a child. It's like, I saw that 64 year old teacher as like a little kid. A lot of times you can, can find a lot of healing in knowing that I'm not alone. We're just little kids. These experiences also happen to my parents and um, my grandparents. I remember him sitting down and telling me about his childhood for the first time. So it goes way back. My mother had a difficult life, I will admit that. Her. Her mother used to send her out to cut her own switches just to beat her with. So my mother had this experience of not being treated right. She was abused. His childhood was worse than mine. His parents got divorced when, they, when he was 12. His mom took half the kids and dad was never home. So middle school and high school, he was mostly home alone. So there's just this abandonment and fending for yourself. I think honestly, because he has so much pain tied to that same place in life, that it's hard for him to like put himself back in the shoes of like a young kid in high school, because he has so much pain there. So I look at it as like he did the best he could. That's not an excuse for him to do the things that he's done. It does help me understand. Well, he's another human being. When I take a step back and look at him as a human being who fails. He made mistakes. Who reaches the end of himself and then cannot fix that by himself. I'm able to like almost put myself in his shoes. You watch your father, that's how you become. If he's emotionally done, that's what you are. You model those emotions 
And if he's angry and stuff, you model that. If he's passive, you model that. And I began to see all this stuff. I model my dad. I had anger issues I had to deal with, just like my dad. I mean, I was a teenager when I started using drugs. I thought I was okay, but I was really bad into drinking. Then it got worse. Um, it was a terrible experience, but it brought me... I landed myself in jail. To the end of myself. There comes a time when, kind of what Norma was saying, you come to the end of yourself and you realize, I'm broken. Looking out for something to kind of numb whatever that I didn't understand that was going on. I started talking like my dad. You know, I started yelling like my dad. I don't know. I thought this was gone, you know what I'm saying? This is here. I mean, it was very easy to tell somebody, you know, be kind, talk nice. But when it comes to you, I, I, that's when I realized, no, I, I can't live life like this. Get angry. What's that mean? All those other characteristics that I wanted weren't in me. And because of the Italian background, there was a lot more anger expressed than anything else. Because your father is the one you learn how to, you learn how to handle your emotions. You watch your father, that's how you become. And that began to hit me. And the reason I caught it, because I remember I have these certain mannerisms, just like my dad. And I'm not even around him. One time, Julia got me all upset because she went quiet down and I grabbed her jaw. Okay, and I squeezed hard. And it hurt her and I grabbed her arm and it squeezed and it hurt her. The next day she was going on again, I went to grab her jaw again and she said, don't touch me, Dad. And then Debbie pulled me aside. You can't do that to your daughter, Larry. She's really scared of you now. Because I'm an intense person, but I never thought it was hurting her that much. So I remember telling God, you know, God, I got a daughter now, and I'm supposed to represent the father to this girl, and I have no idea what to do, God. I need you to, to father me so I can father Angela. That's when really, really hit home for me, because I need to father these kids. I don't, I can't mother, you know, I can't. You know what I'm saying? The, the knowledge that I get is from my mom's relationship and my own personal relationship with God, knowing that the father part is empty. So I could only ignore it for so far, for so long. That's where I really had to dig deep and really get to know, find out who is this God as a father. See, Samoa is a, is a Christian church believing, you know, country. So we grew up with the idea of we have to go to church and to keep that, you know, rules and regulation makes you a, a good person. So I tried that, knowing that I failed a lot, you know, and, uh, but when, the, when, when Father mentioned it was God as a Father, it was really hard for me to connect. My, my relationship with my dad affected a lot of my image of God. More of a, a boss, more of a, this, this, this being that's out there with, with power, you know, and apart from the word father, to be honest, you know. And I knew that right away because it was all mixed up in my head of what God was like. I knew my mentality of God was wrong. I could see it, so I needed him to change it. waiting for Aaron. He's laughing out there with these people. Uh. So I was talking to the bartender and he showed me all those dorm domes or whatever. And he's like, we sleep in there over the winter. And he's like, we got a bunch of swinging beds. And I was like, can we sleep in those tonight? And he's like, let me talk to my boss. And so he walks me over to his boss and he's like, can this dude wants to, wants to sleep in the in the in the swinging beds tonight? And he's like, "Is that okay?" And she was like, "Are they set up?" And and she and he was like, "Yeah, yeah, they've been set up for about three months." And, and so she was like, "Sure." <laughs> so let's 
Can we sleep in there instead? Yeah, yeah, 100%. <laughs> of course. I'm not gonna say no. <laughs> like, oh my god. So, this is James? How James uh, James introduced us to the dome. We're digging water lines right now, but you guys are more than welcome to come visit and you guys can stay in one of the domes tonight. So We're so down. Come yeah. this way. Okay. Where you guys are staying at is the administration dome. Okay. Right. That's this one. It's a 1,700 square foot dome. It's everything on the inside, we built. Wow. This is going to be our registration. That's our Instagram board. These are the swinging beds. These will sustain 876 pounds. Uh -huh. Catch your friend in the middle of the night. Yeah. <laughs> Just give him a spin. We're building a bench over here. And one of the things I'm carving in the bench is come see the skies our way. Hmm. And that's for Kloshizer. That's job. like what this is. This that's is what all of this is. Hundred square foot window. Plus, that's their sky so resorts cool. has offered me the position to go to the Grand Canyon and build another 80. Oh, so wait, wait. So okay. So yes. are you just an expert in like domes? Like I'm a carpenter. I'm I just you're, carpenter. okay. I love working with my hands. Being a carpenter you for the last stuff. thirty years, I can tell people That's I so built cool. this. Yeah. I built this. I built mm. this. They can go see what I've done. If mm. I can only take one step in the path of Jesus, I'm set for life. I will never take that step that He done. Yeah. But if I can provide for the people and the younger generation and teach them what I know, uh -huh. treat going. people the way you want to be treated, yeah. whether they treat you that way or not, yeah. pay it forward. Somebody's going to come up to you and say, you're having a bad day, friend. <laughs> you need a hug. <laughs> it's going to change your whole life. That's why I give so much away. What this the heck? I will always come back to you said Jesus like a carpenter. What do you know about Jesus? What do I know about Jesus? Yeah. Legitimately, what the heck? This is insane. Is there, are there like other religions that talk about God like a father? No. Even Islam doesn't. Because nobody's worthy to be a son. So there's a big issue there. If you're going to see you're a son of God, you better be worthy. Yeah, so no one, Islam, Allah, nobody's Allah's son because nobody's worthy. Jesus is the mind blower. <laughs> he made us worthy. No man spoke like him. No man ever has spoken like Jesus has spoke. Doesn't matter what you've gone through, I've been there. Doesn't matter how much pain you've had. I carried a cross on my shoulders for damn near two miles. They drove spikes through my hands. They put spikes across my head. They stabbed me in the lungs with a torch and they put vinegar in my mouth to help me die. He went through more pain than any of us have gone through. No other religion makes us worthy to be sons. It can't. He went through it. He went through it. He went through it all. But he also bore the wrath of God. Yes, he did. And so you and I can be forgiven. How was Jesus able to do that? Was, was he, he God? Able to do it? He was not a God. And only God says, I have sent my son, then you can become a son. So how is he able to forgive you your sins? He's the son of God. Okay, who is the Father? The Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. They are all one. Jesus was excited to be a son and, and, and brag about his dad because he knows his dad. Most of his story was about his dad. He just loved his dad. You know, that Jesus as a son loved his dad and was like, if you only know my father, if you only know, it's like, you know, Jesus said, every good gift come from my father. All of what we need and I'm his son. And 2,000 years are we sat down with a lady in Newtown. She talked about how she got her healing from going to sweat lodges and talking about there's a spirit, there's a creator yeah, that yeah. goes back and makes her. It was very interesting, like, she was like... Close. What really hit hard for me is when I have my child. That's where I really had to dig deep and really find out who is this God as a father. What did he show you? Like, it was the opposite. <laughs> of everything that I grew up. Because we don't want an energy to run us. We don't want some force to run us. We crave 
a relationship. It's more than, you know, than just a God. Otherwise, you're just a creature. There's not that depth of father, son. And that's what you want. He has to be a father. And that's what you have to have. The fact that we have this tangible story of Jesus can do a lot to, like, help us understand that Jesus is so different from a imperfect earthly father. They nailed him to the wrists, and they stabbed him and executed him. When they executed him, the skies went black. And I hear this voice in my head say, I did this for you. I couldn't believe it was so beautiful. I lost it. <laughs> and his character, it's kind and patient. He's a loving father. All the things that I knew my dad should have been and more, that's who my God is. And so I've just trusted him. That father that when I was little, I longed for, you know, I guess that you it's never had. That was when a lot of hurt came back up again because all I saw was the early part of my kid's life, you know, like all I saw was fail. I kept failing, I, kept, I failed the way I started talking like my dad. And that's why it's amazing because Larry here is the guy that, that walked it out with me. And all he was doing with me is kind of almost like took my hand. and lead me to see God, the Father, you know? And, and that's what you end up doing with people. You know, you can advise, but it, the, the best is to take that person to see the Father. on this trip. I don't know. Uh, honestly, it takes a realization that your dad is a human being just like you. Yeah. And God is not that. He is a perfect being who loves you perfectly. He was always there. When my daughters left and he went through struggles and I asked him what helped because we know you loved us and we knew God was a good God, Dad. You have to have that, otherwise, if you start questioning he's a good God, what are you gonna do when times get tough? You ain't gonna fall, you won't hold on. At the beginning of this year, I was just like, I was mad at God for like the first time in my life. It's like, God, how the hell would you let me go through this? Why would you let this happen? But if you know he's good, no matter what I go through, he's good God to me. I hold on. This feeling will pass. I know it will pass. Because I know what's true. Done these things last night. Woo. Good sleep. Yeah, it was amazing. It was a good sleep. It was so great. The 
um, amount. It felt like like sleeping on like a cloud because you're suspended in the air. Suspended. It's crazy. I can't believe we slept here. We texted Rachel. Here, read this text. We have decided to not to leave until we get in the sky. If it means building our own spaceship, so be it. <laughs> and um, Rachel saved the day. So we have one last connection, and I'm about to call and ask him if he can get us in the sky. This is Brian. Hey, Brian. Uh, this is Aaron. Uh, I got your number from Rachel and uh, Benji. Uh, oh. Yeah, we stayed with Benji and Jolinda. Um, uh -huh. Old friends, yeah. Yeah, and they are probably the most hospitable people I have ever met in my life. Yeah, they're great folks. We were wondering if you were able at all tomorrow to sit down with us and talk to us about your life, and they, they said you owned a airplane. Well, um, yeah, I guess I could meet with you tomorrow. I may be going flying in the morning show you the airplane and we can chat a bit. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Uh, you said go flying in the morning? Yeah, I mean, if you want to go flying later in the day, we could do that too. Okay. Yeah, yeah, we have uh, most of the day, so... All right, well, let me, uh, when this thing firms up <clears throat> with this other guy, I'll send, is this your cell phone, I guess? Yeah, this is my cell phone. I can send you, send you a text and uh, let you know what my schedule looks like. Alrighty, thank you so much for your time. Um, and I look forward to hearing back from you, Brian. Yep, sounds good. <clears throat> Alright, talk to you later. Bye. Bye. <laughs> <laughs>
to work with, to let go, to forgive my dad. And that's from walking with uh, Larry and Nicholas. Really helped me to see God's heart for my own dad. Because, you know, if you don't really know the kind of person you're forgiving, it's just like, uh, you know, something you just shoot up in the air. But uh, the more he walked with me to understand God and as a father, helped me to understand what kind of father I had, you know. And I just look at my own dad, you know, still caring. And I think that's why he was so mean and abusive because of his, you know. But when we made that deal, when we started forgiving each other, it was, something changed with my dad. It was a lot more softer. And it's not like, oh, I forgive you for this event. Okay, that one's done. That layer's It's not even like that. It's almost like like the depth of the bitterness and the, the hate or whatever those feelings are. It's like it, you just get softer and softer and softer and softer. It's like all of a sudden the, the hurt, you know, and the pain and the dark, they get kind of washed away. And we started seeing, you know, the good that my mom saw in dad. And he, he, was, he was started talking positive about us. You know, and, and I guess, he, I, I think the, the, the better part of him was tastes much better than the bitterness and the hurts, you know, just. And then with today, there might be something said or something not said, something done or something not done, and it just rolls off your back. Wow. <laughs> <It's been laughs> a lot to unpack, a lot to think about. So. Yeah, can I? I just want to give you a hug. But anyway, to finish the story, my little girl sat on this lap. And God says, This is a picture of my father's lap. The one that doesn't hurt and the one that gets hurt, they both sit. Isn't that a good one? <laughs> All goes on in the world right now. They need to sit on the Father's lap, and God will bring healing to both people. It was a really powerful picture, and I never forgot it. Can I get to take a picture with you guys? Yeah. I never finished my memoirs. I'm pretty sure you get a copy. Oh, yeah. Can I get your picture really quick? Otherwise, you can blame this. It isn't blaming, it's healing you want, and restoration you want. The last verse is in Malachi, right? Before Elijah comes in the great and terrible day of the Lord. I restore the children to the father and fathers to the children. Or I will strike the land with a curse. So this last part is the restoration of families. When Sika shares about the father heart, like he did, I cry, because he's got it. It'll go on. And that is really good. <laughs>